I don't know about you, but I cannot stand that word digital transformation. For the past five to seven years, maybe even 10, every company here in Silicon Valley has tried to associate themselves with that language and for good reason. Now on the surface, it describes this evolution in business, almost a call to action for business to go digital and that people, process, and technology are required to do that. And certainly what's transpired recently with COVID-19, that has accelerated this conversation and digital transformation is even more important now than it was in late 2019. About a year ago, I was curious to see which companies actually own that term. So I did a media analysis and looked at all news coverage for five years and pulled in every mention of digital transformation and then extracted the top companies that were mentioned in that context. I also did the same thing with social media conversations as well as mentions in forum posts in Reddit and others. And I even used Alexa.com to do a search analysis or what they call a share of organic search to see which companies were ranking well and at the top for digital transformation. And in each of those three analyses, there were several companies that were being referenced the most. Now, one company stood out. I'm not going to mention their name, but they're headquartered in or around Seattle, Washington, in case you're interested. So then I went to the web archives to cross-reference old web pages to see if these companies themselves were using the same language in older web content and web pages. But this is only half the data point because I also wanted to understand who were those influential people using these terms and how were they using it and in what context. And after about three hours of searching Google, Twitter, YouTube, I found several references of both digital and business transformation dating back to 2005, 2006. It's hard to tell who was actually first, but it's very clear once I looked at their profiles was that these were very influential people. Journalists, analysts, technologists, all talking about this evolution in business almost 15 years ago. So what does this story, my analysis, have to do with influencer marketing? Well, let me tell you. Throughout all this research, it was very clear to me that these companies were tracking and listening to the influencer community. More importantly, they were taking action. They became active participants in talking about the same things the influencers were talking about, creating web pages, publishing mobile content, social content, and even earned media. They were using influencer intelligence, incorporating that intelligence into their narratives, and 10 to 15 years later, they're still reaping the benefits of doing so. So once you identify that top 1%, and please make sure that they are truly the top 1%, you can learn a lot by listening. Understanding what influencers are saying over time is very critical. You can spot patterns and see if there are any topics or interests that are gaining in popularity or declining in popularity. And if you have a really smart data scientist on staff, you can start to predict topics that will become popular uh, within this group. Now you can also do the same thing in real time. Now that's money if you're doing organic influencer engagement. You can also study the context of the conversation. This is very important. Are they talking about digital transformation within the context of technology adoption, scaling in the enterprise, business culture, or enterprise security? All of these things are important, yet are different. And then lastly is sentiment analysis. And I'm not a huge fan at tracking sentiment for uh, a lot of reasons, but the smaller audiences, like a group of influencers, it's a little bit easier to do that and hand code the content to get a better understanding of how they feel about a specific topic. So the question is, how is this an actual influencer marketing program if we haven't engaged with influencers yet? Well, if you haven't been following, or maybe I haven't done a great job at articulating this, but this type of data and intelligence can inform a lot. It can inform just about any headline that you pitch to the media, any press releases or briefings. It can inform the blogs and communities, the headlines and the actual content that you're publishing on your own channels. And for you SEO gurus, on-page optimization. So the metadata and HTML, you optimize those for the same language. And if you're in paid search, you can use this data to optimize your keywords and phrases to make sure that you are bidding on the right keywords. And even your titles and descriptions for your YouTube videos and slideshare presentations. If you're using the right language and, and the descriptions, um, all of a sudden that content, those videos and slideshare presentations are going to appear higher in the search results. And even your employees and executives who are representing the brand externally, equipping them with the right language to use to be more relevant to audiences. And then lastly, your social assets. Everything from post copy to ebooks to webinars to just about anything else that you publish on the internet can be informed by data. Now, if you ask me, this is a pretty strong influencer marketing program. Assuming you do everything that I told you to do and you optimize all of your content and your assets and your headlines, uh, that is strong. That in itself is a very effective 
uh, way to engage with influencers without actually engaging with influencers. Now in my next video, I'm gonna talk about some of the basics and advanced ways to engage with influencers organically. And if you've seen any of my videos, you would notice that everything is built on the foundation of data. Everything I talk about relies on analysis and research to better inform something. And in this case, it's influencer data. But you have to do more than just analyze and listen. So why do I lead with data? Well, I'm glad you asked that because it's a very important question. Now, there are three reasons why I do this. Number one, data takes out the guesswork. Number two, it uncovers market, audience, and influencer white space. And number three, it surfaces new audiences. The only caveat is that your data must be defendable. Otherwise, there goes your credibility. And that, my friends, will conclude our time together today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for sharing and your feedback. Please stay safe. Please stay healthy. And I'll see you next time.